I'll tell you what chapter and verse is a little later. Turn to the book of Romans. Uh, Brother Dean made reference to the uh, perpetual pa- prayer. Prope- that's not easy to say. Perpetual pa- prayer. And so that's uh, starting tonight at 6 o'clock. And what that is, is his Sunday school class uh, decided they would and then invited us to be part of that, is that between now and the election on November the 3rd, that we're going to pray around the clock, hopefully have people praying in 30-minute time slots for God's will to be done. I'm not going to tell you to pray for one candidate or another. I'm going to tell you to pray for God's will to be done. I am not going to pray for one candidate or another. I'm going to pray for God's will to be done. And with that said, there's still some time slots open. The uh, sign-up sheet schedule is on the Narthex table. And uh, you can look at that on your way out if you could do that. And I was thinking about that, Brother Dean, while you were singing. And if my math is correct, what we're asking from you, what Brother Dean and his class is asking from you, is one forty-eighth of your day. One forty-eighth of your day for the next 30 days. One forty-eighth, meaning... For every 47 minutes that God give you to breathe, we're asking you to give him one minute back. Now think about that. For every 47 minutes that God give you, we're asking you to give one minute back in prayer for God's will to be done. So you're welcome to sign up. We've got some visitors with us here today. We, we thank you for being part of our service, and we're glad God led you this way, and we hope he'll give you what you need. If you feel impressed to pray with us, put your name on that list. You're more than welcome too. We just want to know God's people are praying. And we're praying for God's will to be done. We preached about that a couple weeks ago. Uh, I, I had to preach this week, uh, regardless of what I look like or felt like, because I hadn't preached in the last two weeks. Last week, church was kind enough to let me and Karen go out of town for a few days over her birthday, and we appreciate that. So Brother Chad filled in for us. And the week before, we had a missionary. And so I'm glad to be back here, and I'm glad to be in the pulpit today and be able to preach from the Word of God. This morning's service is probably going to be a little different, maybe than what our normal services are. I've said, made the statement many times, and I'll make it again now, that outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe the great Apostle Paul was probably the greatest man to walk across the New Testament Scriptures. Uh, I enjoy reading Paul's writings. I enjoy when we, uh, on Wednesday nights, when we studied his missionary journeys through the book of Acts, verse by verse. I enjoy reading the things that he wrote because I can relate to Paul. When you get into chapter 7, much like Brother Dean just preached, and we're not going to chapter 7, so don't get ahead of me. Don't be flipping, just wait. But when you get into chapter 7, you find out that the great apostle Paul said, uh, that which I would. I do not that which I would not that I do and what he's saying is all the things I want to do for God it seems like I'm not doing those things and the things that I want to do for myself it seems like that the thing that's the things I'm doing much about what brother Dean just sang about but God's faithful he was faithful to Paul and he's faithful to us and I think to myself if the great apostle Paul fought that battle and lost no wonder I lose sometimes so I was thinking about that, been reading in the last couple uh, times that we've preached, we've preached out of the book of Romans, a couple different chapters there. And I want to start today by talking about salvation and the blessings or the benefits of being a Christian. Uh, it is a blessing to be at the house of God this morning, amen? There's a lot of places, uh, I don't take for granted that I'm standing here this morning I told you I hooked my toe on, a, on the edge of a trailer ramp. I fell. I hit first onto the asphalt without being able to catch myself with my hands. In my mind, during that what seemed like an hour fall from top to bottom, and yet it happened so quickly, I thought I'm going to lose every tooth in my head. I'm going to have some type of head trauma, brain trauma. A lot of things could have occurred, and I thought about that all the way down. But we have blessings, and what I'm saying is, it is a blessing and a benefit 
So when I got done with that, Karen come got me, took me to the ER, and she said, did you notify the church? And I said, no. And then what I said was, I guess I should because I fuss at them for not letting me know. And if I found out one of you did the same thing I did and you didn't let me know and others to pray for you, then I would be upset. So I said, I guess I should. And so I did. And that's the reason uh, that I did. It wasn't for simply not looking for any of that. It is what it is. Uh, Alicia, when she read part of it, she said, Preacher, you're tough. I said, if you're going to be stupid, you've got to be tough. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it is. That's there. So, but one of, the great, one of the benefits of being a Christian is I've got a church family that I can call on. I know that they'll pray for me. And they love me and they care for me. And they'll do anything they could. I couldn't tell you the number of people in this church, other Christian friends I have outside of this church, that offer to do all kinds of things for me. I said, no, I'm not hurt like that. I'm okay. I'm okay. But they as soon were willing to do anything they could. I wrote down a few things here. Uh, that, that are uh, tied to being a Christian, that are blessings, that are benefits. Eternal life, is there anything any greater? Than knowing we have eternal life. Prayer, we just made mention of. Knowing God is always there, that He's faithful. Knowing Christ is the good shepherd that laid down His life for the sheep. Knowing Christ is the great shepherd that's risen from the dead. Knowing Christ is the chief shepherd that's coming again with crowns of glory. What about being led by the Holy Spirit of God in the way we should go? What about having peace and happiness regardless of the circumstances that are going on? These are benefits and blessings of being a Christian. Now I'm going to ask you and I want somebody to yell out something back to me so I don't stand here and look stupid. I want you to yell out something back to me. What would you consider to be a great blessing of being a child of God? Say it. Knowing the Lord. I like that. There's many things. These are all blessings of being a child of God. So we know that, that being a child of God, being saved by the grace of God, uh, being heaven bound and hell proof, we know that that comes with many benefits, many blessings, and things that we enjoy every day. We enjoy the hand of God being over our lives every day and protecting us from the things that the devil would do. We know that. And so we've established that fact. It is a blessing to be a child of God. But now I'm going to ask you a question that you may never think you would hear me ask. What would, it, what would it take? What would it take for you to be given to you or that you could acquire? What would it take for you to be willing to give up all those blessings? What would it take to reject the benefits and the blessings of God? What would it take, if anything, would, would, would happen in your life that you would be willing to deny your salvation and give it back? Well, everybody in here is answering the same way. And so I can see by your responses and hear by your uh, verbiage that there's absolutely nothing was what everybody said. They shook their head one way or the other and said nothing. Now, it might shock you. It might shock you to find out that the great apostle Paul, he said there was one thing that he would be willing to give up his there was one thing that he would be willing to be accursed of God for in the Word of God. You say, are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. The, apostle, the great Apostle Paul wrote it. And he wasn't just flippant talk. He said, as the Holy Ghost is his witness, he would give up his salvation for this one thing. While you're pondering on that, and you think your pastor's crazy, I'm going to prove it to you. But while you're pondering, I want to read you some things that the great apostle Paul wrote as the blessings of God in the book of Romans. I'm going to go through them rather quickly. He said in, in chapter, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 7, also verse 17, that we're called into sainthood by God's grace. Romans 3, 20 through 24, that we've been justified before God through grace. If you ever want to know what justified means, and I'm not turning to any of these verses that I'm reading to you. So 
Don't want to do you no good turn there. I hear pages. We're justified by grace. What does that word justified mean? It's in the very verbiage. Justified. Just if I'd never sinned. That's what it means. Isn't that great? Just if I'd never sinned, God has justified me and made me holy. Holy because of his blood. Let me move on. We have access to the grace of God in Romans 5, 1 and 2. We are at peace with God through the grace of God in Romans 5 through 11. Uh, we're dead to life in Adam and alive through Christ in Romans 5, 12 through 21. We've been set free from the power of sin in Romans 6, 4 through 7. We've been set free to live above sin in Romans 6, 17 through 18. We're no longer tied to sin in Romans chapter 7. And, and we sin uh, when we sin because of the flesh we can live above that flesh through the Spirit in Romans chapter 8. We're alive in the Holy Spirit, united with Christ, and adopted as a child of God in Romans 8, 15 through 17. And we can experience victory in, in spite of circumstances and situations in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 20. And this is just the beginning of all the blessings of God. And yet the great apostle Paul said he would be willing to give up all of those things. To be accursed of God for one thing and one thing only. So turn with me. Now, let me, before I say, I want you to understand. Before you leave and say something I'm not saying. You know from my preaching and what the Word of God says and what I believe. You know as well as I do, you couldn't make your salvation. You can your salvation do not leave here today and say well my preacher said i could give it back if i want and that's not what i'm saying at all and that's not what paul was saying but paul was saying in his heart and the holy ghost knew his heart that he would give his salvation back and be accursed of god if he could we know that we cannot give our salvation back because it's not yours to begin with salvation is not in our hands it's in the hands of god God possesses it, and if you and I, if our salvation was to go away, you'd have to destroy the very hand of God. The Bible says in the book of John, chapter 10, in verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life, words of Christ, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So we know that can't happen. You say, preacher, you believe that once saved, always saved? Absolutely. If you ever get saved by the grace of God, you've been placed into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, covered in His blood. There's nothing can wash that away. You just better make sure you get in to start with. Everything running around here calling themselves Christians isn't a Christian. Be born again, saved by the grace of God. Confess your sins to a holy God. So have been Romans over the last several, several weeks. We've preached out of it a couple times leading up to today. I came to chapter 9. Turn with me to Romans chapter 9. We're going to read the first five verses and we're going to see what Paul said here. Because you've looked at me like I was crazy since I said, made that statement. And I understand why. But let's read what the Bible says. Romans chapter number 9, starting in verse 1. We'll read the first five verses. Paul said this, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. So what he's saying is what he's saying is in jest. The Holy Ghost knows that he means what he's about to say. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Listen, verse 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom is concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever. Amen. The great apostle Paul 
as he begins all the way back, I believe it's in chapter 3, where he begins talking about the advantages uh, that the Israelites have. Jewish people have and he lists some of those even right here that Christ came to the Jewish people he was part of their people let's read it again in verse 4 they're Israelites pertaining to the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises who are the fathers of all these things uh, were given to the nation of Israel and yet they had rejected the Lord Jesus Christ they had crucified him at the hands of an angry mob that hung him on a cross between two thieves on Golgotha's hill they watched him die they jeered them on they cried crucify him crucify him and yet the great apostle Paul said if I could be a cursed of Jesus Christ I would give my life for my people a burden church that's a burden that we're missing today in our churches for the lost people the apostle Paul knew that there was a heaven to gain that there was a hell to shun and he knew that with outside the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the people that he loved the Israelites were going to die and go to a devil's hell Paul was saying Holy Ghost knows my heart. He knows my mind. He knows my thoughts. And if it were possible, and we know it's not. But he said, if it was possible, I would die and be accursed of God. I would die and go to hell if it would save the other Israelites. Now you think about that. That's a hard statement to make. He just spent eight chapters telling us about all the blessings that come with salvation. We know how it changed his life from Saul to Paul. We know what it did for him internally. We know how he preached and he loved the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet he said he would give up all those things. But for one thing only. And that was the salvation of his people. He wouldn't give it up for wealth. He had that. He wouldn't give it up for, for, for status. He had that. He wouldn't give up for popularity he was popular among his people he wouldn't give it up for power he had power he was out cruci- or not, uh, he was out uh, uh, coming upon the people of Christ and afflicting the people of Christ the great apostle Paul what a statement to make I thought a lot about that statement in verse number three for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. The great apostle Paul made this statement that if I could be accursed of Christ, for them I would. Now you and I could probably relate to that type of love in one manner or another, whether it be to our spouse. Uh, You know, hey, We would walk through hell and back for our spouse or for our children. We would do anything in this world, or we should, if if we're worth the salt in our bread as parents, we'd do anything in this world to make sure our children don't die and go to hell. And we should feel the same way about them that the Apostle Paul did here. If it was possible for me to give up my salvation to make sure my children, which both are saved, but to make sure that they could be saved or my grandchildren saved, I would do so. If that's what it took, I would try to, I would suffer in their place. We might do that for a parent. We might, there might even be some that would do that for a best friend. I don't know. But the great apostle Paul here said he would do it for his nation. And he was sincere. That's the whole part of one. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. He wasn't just saying it because he knew it couldn't happen. You know, that's like offering to help somebody when you know you can't. That, 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 what kind of, you know, that doesn't mean anything. He knew he couldn't, but, he, but the Holy Ghost knew the desire of his heart. He had that much love and desire to see people saved. We need that in our church. We need that in our churches. There's an old, old preacher, in fact, born in 1714, died in 1770 by the name of George Whitfield. I've read some of his writings. I've read some about his life and his ministry, and he had that kind of passion. He made this statement, and this is a strong statement. 
He made this statement one time to a non-Christian, to a lost person. He made this statement. He wanted to lead them to Christ. Listen to this statement. He said that he was willing to go with him to jail or even to hell, but he was willing to go to heaven without him. In other words, I'm going to do everything i got to do to make sure I'm going to heaven and I'm going to make sure it is unacceptable in my life to go to heaven and not bring you with me. That's what he's saying. That's the kind of burden that we need. That's what evangelism is all about. That's what sharing the gospel is all about. That's the burden the church should have for the lost world is that we're willing to make a sacrifice to see people saved. Brother Dean's asking us for one-forty-eighth of our day to sacrifice our nation and that people could be saved. How can you tie those together? Because when our nation gets so far that they condemn religion and organize religion and we can't meet here, things are going to change. And the rate our nation is going and what's being taught in our colleges, we better get our children in early. We better get them in early. So that's the kind of passion that we need to lead people to Christ. Paul was willing. Paul was willing to, to, to go to hell, as the Bible says here, to be accursed from Christ for my brethren. He was willing to do that in exchange for four things real quick. And I'm going to close in a moment because I want to give you this thought and I want you to carry it home. First of all, he was willing to be accursed from Christ to keep them from going to hell. I have preached on hell. The Bible is very graphic when it comes to hell. It says it's a place of smoke and torment where the, where the flames are never quenched. Uh, that We have the, uh, the rich man and Lazarus. We read that where he begged for a drop of water on his tongue. Hell is a terrible place, church. If you've ever burnt yourself at all, you know how bad a burn hurts. And yet to be engulfed and feel, those, feel that pain for all of eternity. If we truly believe that, we'd lose sleep at night worried about people dying and going to hell. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, amen? I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Paul said he'd rather be a curse of Christ than for his kinsmen, the Israelites, his people, to die and go to hell. The second thing, he'd be willing to be a curse from Christ is if he could persuade them that Christ was the Savior and the Messiah. He is speaking to people that rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. They thought he was a great teacher. They thought he was a prophet. But he was the Son of God. They rejected him as the Son of God. They crucified him on a rugged cross and they cried crucify him. Said let his blood be upon our hands and our children. Paul said he's willing to be a curse from God if he could persuade his people that Jesus sent from God, the only begotten Son of God, to die for the sins of mankind. That's the gospel message, church. We have complicated that. We've made it so people don't understand it. We've made it so people think they need a Ph.D. in the Bible in order to be saved. It's very simple to be saved. Confess your sins. Turn from your wicked ways. And ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your heart and life and be your Savior. And he said, eyes cast you out. Amen. He's willing to be a curse from God if it would allow his people, the Israelites, his people, his flesh, his kinsmen, to experience And enjoy all those blessings that we talked about. He was willing to give all those blessings up so that they could enjoy them. If it was possible. You and I know it's not. So you might be sitting there and thinking, well, I could make that same statement like Paul because I know it it can't happen. But I believe verse 1 takes that out for you and I. Verse 1 tells me that the great apostle Paul, if it were possible, he would have done it. And the Holy Ghost knew he would have done it. If that was not a true statement, then it wouldn't be in this Bible. Amen? It wouldn't be in the Word of God. So he was willing to give up all the blessings of God, all the things that you and I... And listen, I wasn't trying to trick you. 
Because if I was sitting in your place and, and, and somebody asked me, what would I be willing to, uh, to give or what would I be willing to accept to give up the blessings of God? I'd have said not a thing. Amen? So I wasn't trying to trick you. That wasn't the point. The point is we need a greater burden for lost people. And I do believe right now, with all that's going on in our country, with the pandemic, with churches being closed, I about made a statement I shouldn't make, so I won't make it. I was going to say some of them need to stay closed, but I'm not going to say that. If they're not preaching the truth, they need to stay closed. If they're not preaching the word of God and salvation, they need to stay closed. Amen? They're not churches to begin with. It's not based on the word of God. But with churches closed and people not being able to go to the house of God, with, with our country and the shape it's in, with the election and, the, and the, the polar opposites that we're seeing before us, with all that occurring, it creates a great opportunity for the church to share the gospel. Invite people to church. Amen? I'm going to give you a challenge. We've got some people in here. We've got a lot of people in here that are all over social media. There's a lot of mixed responses as to social media. Whether it's good, and I, whether, it's good whether it's bad, it's both. It's, what, it's like anything else. It's what you make out of it. It can be both. But let's start by, when you're, when you're making all these posts, and you're putting all these things, this week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, go on there sometime, somewhere this week, and put West Corinth Baptist Church is open for business. Invite people to come to our church. Tell them we have singing, we have preaching, we want them to come and be part of the house of God. If somebody responds back, I'm not good enough, say you'll fit right in because we're not either. Amen? Because we're not either. None of us. So tell them. I, I received a phone call yesterday. I was back up here at the church yesterday studying. And the phone rang. Somebody I'd never met. I don't know if they're here this morning or not. Don't remember the name right now. But just simply ask me, are you having services? Yes, ma'am, we are. She asked me some more questions. We are open for service. I told her that we're asking everybody to do what you think is best for you. If you're not comfortable in the sanctuary, you can go to the back. And you can sit and watch it live stream in the back, wherever you're the most comfortable. That's what you should do. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to police you. I'm not going to dictate. You're adults. You make up your mind what's best for you. Are you open? The church should always be open. Because people are dying and going to hell every day without God. The last thing. I'm going to close in just a moment. The fourth thing. Paul's willing to be accursed from Christ. Willing to be cut off from Christ, a curse from Christ, die and go to hell for the salvation of others. How many of these people, his kinsmen, the Israelites, how many of them do you think despise Paul? These were not all sending him Christmas cards, church. They wasn't sending him birthday presents. They despised Paul for his stance on the Lord Jesus Christ because it convicted them of their sins of crucifying him. And yet Paul said, I'd be a curse from Christ if my kinsman could be born again. So it's not just his friends, not just those that are friendly to him. It's lost people, lost people. So that's a big price to pay right there. Now we know he couldn't. Is salvation. But we talked about He gave up his social status and his reputation. He gave up his health and his wealth. He gave up his time, his energy, and his resources. And according to history, he eventually gave up his very life as a martyr to the Caesar. All these things he did. Paul gave up practically everything he had for the salvation of others. So then I'm going to ask you this very simple question in closing. What have we given up? What have we given up? I'll start by saying as a church, what have we given up? And as individuals, notice I said we. I'm not pointing fingers at you. I said we. As a church, what have we given up?
as individuals, what have we given up? What sacrifices have we truly made? What price have we really paid for the salvation of others? I'm glad I'm saved. I believe heaven's real, and I believe hell's real. And if I believe that, it should drive me to tell more people about Jesus. Amen? The great apostle Paul said I, he's willing to be accursed from Jesus Christ, that his kinsmen, his people could come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We need that kind of love and compassion for this world. Let's pray. Father, I ask you, Lord God, to burden our hearts, to show us what we can do, to show us where we can go, what we can say, and what we can do to push the gospel forward. Lord, we know that each one here with under the sound of my voice and those that are watching by live stream, we know that each and every day of our life, we come in contact with people that are lost. That with people that if someone doesn't tell them about salvation, if someone doesn't tell them that Jesus loves them and died for them, they're going to die and go to a devil's hell. Lord, I don't have any false thoughts or ideas that, that we could save the world. But Lord, if we can just get one more, just one more, just tell one more about Jesus, and then they may grow up to do the same. Lord, it'll make a difference. And Lord, it's worth it all if it just saves one more from a devil's hell. Father, help us to do your will. Father, during this 30 days, I pray that you'd bless all those that'll take time out of their day. That one forty-eighth of a day. That we would take that time just to seek your faith. Lord, we may not know the words to continually pour out over that 30-minute period of time. We may fail for those words at times. But you know our needs. You know our hearts. You know our yearnings. So, Father, we ask you to do that which we simply cannot do. We ask you to be with us, encourage us, and help us. In Jesus' name, amen.